Welcome to the ITSB Magazine Podcast Network. You're listening to a new episode of the Leading Edge Discovery Podcast, where host and astronaut Charlie Camarda and his intriguing variety of guests share their visions for transforming the way we work, learn, and solve some of the most daunting challenges on Earth and throughout the solar system. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Okay. Hello, my name is Charlie Kamada. I was an astronaut on the Space Shuttle D- Discovery on the return to flight mission following the Columbia accident. I will be a host today for the Leading Edge Discovery podcast series where we'll, we will be talking to experts from around the world, but mostly in the United States, about the importance of science, technology, engineering, and especially research, why we need to do research. Our first series of episodes are going to focus on NASA, the aerospace industry, and in particular, the Columbia accident. Okay, I was uh, I flew right after the Columbia accident. It's a it's a subject which is near and dear to my heart, and I feel like the people that enabled us to understand what caused the problem and to get us back up and flying safe most of them came from the research centers and a research background. And so I want this series, this first series of episodes to also be a tribute to those people, those unsung heroes and and their expertise that helped solve these problems and get us back up flying safe. And to kick off this series, I'm going to start with uh, a person that's a dear friend, colleague, near and dear to my heart, from NASA Langley Research Center, Dr. Michael Nemeth, who is an expert in structural mechanics. And he's gonna tell you all about what that means, the discipline of structural mechanics um, and why we need to understand that and his work also on return to flight. And Mike is also gonna help us start the discussion and understanding of what the difference is between a researcher and a research engineer and what an engineer does and and why that's important and why we do that. So, Mike, um, good afternoon. I want to welcome you to the show. It's an honor for us to have you here. And I want you to go ahead and, and tell us your story, Mike. Why? What made you want to be an engineer? What made you want to go into research, you know, from that that little boy in um, in Carolina Beach? Yep. Take it away. Carolina Beach, North Carolina, at that time where I grew up, it was fairly rural, particularly in the wintertime. There was maybe a thousand people there or maybe a few more, but not a whole lot. It was a small town. Um, Probably my first step was working for a dredging company when I turned 14. I was fairly strong for my age, I would say. And I worked for a man named Earl Klutz who had an incredible work ethic that he drilled into all the employees. My main tool was a shovel, (laughs) but he was an interesting person in that he was uh, shot down over North Africa during World War II. He was as part of a B-17 crew and uh, he always carried a pair of pliers in his back pocket wherever he went, just because he claims those pliers saved his life and when he was shot down. And he had such tremendous uh, hand strength that he could take a pair of pliers, squeeze them and break them in two. (laughs) And he had a drawer full, I saw it, a drawer full of craftsman pliers that he was just waiting to take back to see. (laughs) They hated to see him coming. But uh, I mean, that was a big impression on, you know, somebody of my age at that time. And he taught me a lot of skills. He taught me how to weld. He taught me how to drive a bulldozer or crane, dump truck. You name it. I was driving a crane down the highway before I even had a driver's license. He said, I don't worry about it. (laughs) (laughs) That's sort of thing. But the the work ethic that he instilled made a lasting impression on me. And um, I had another person I worked for uh, named Odell Evans. He ran a petroleum outfitters type company where we go around repairing gasoline tanks and gas pumps and all that sort of stuff and there's a lot of heavy construction in that also burying tanks cutting manifolds in half of partially filled 
um, gasoline tanks with a hacksaw, you know, that, that was pretty exciting. You never know when it's going to blow. Could have been very exciting. <laughs> but also very, uh, very strong work ethic of that generation. But probably what uh, drove me the most was that when I was 17, my father lost his eyesight from a, a nerve disease, optical nerve disease. So I knew at that point I was sort of on my own that I'd better decide to do something and uh, figure it out pretty quick because uh, it was getting time when I have to be leaving home, you know. Uh, other jobs that I had along the way that helped me decide I wanted a career other than manual labor. Uh, like I said, I spent a lot of time with that shovel was uh, I worked at the boat docks cleaning fish. A fairly disgusting job, and my mother <laughs> let me stand on the, the back steps as she hosed me down before she let me in the house. <laughs> so th those things sort of led to it. Then in high school, uh, I probably wasn't your model student, to say the least. But I had this knack for technical drawing. I took three years of that and ended up completing the most hours ever completed in the history of the high school was pretty good at it. And the teacher said, well, maybe you should consider architecture. You know, and I thought, well, okay, sounds reasonable. Looks pretty interesting. So I did that. I uh, applied to, uh, or I was going to apply to NC State, the only school that did that near where I lived. You know, you have to go for the low budget stuff. And um, guidance counselor said, well, you know, you, you're not gonna get into college unless you have all these maths. And so I said, what? <laughs> yeah, so senior year, I had to take all the math requirements simultaneously. And this was like six weeks that already passed into the school year. So here I go to the teacher and I, I tell her, I said, you know, I want to take all these classes that you teach. And she looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, well, you know, I'd at least like to try. Okay, you can try. So she saw how hard I was trying actually it would stay after school with me for an hour or so and, and uh, helped teach me through these subjects. And, and it turned out I did really well. I seemed to have a knack for that sort of thing. So I applied. Yeah. Mike, I'd say so. I mean, you, you caught up on all this math in a very short period of time. It's amazing what you can do when you have to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have a real motivation. I think probably before that I had absolutely zero, zero motivation in high school. You know, just go there because I had to and do what I had to do so I could get out and come home and goof off. So you really didn't know that you had this knack until until this need came. Right. And this desire. Uh, and were you never tested for um, IQ, for instance? I don't think so. Uh, because if you were, I think you would have been off the charts and people would have known very early on. Well, I don't know. Anyhow, when I uh, applied to NC State, they said, well, School of Architecture, they said, well, you're probably not what we're looking for, but we're going to put you in civil engineering. And I thought, as it played out, this was absolutely the best thing that could have happened to me, because that's where my real interest lied. It wasn't really in design, design and buildings and things like that. It was the, it was the science of engineering that really excited me and I found fascinating. And um, I spent the next four years, you know, taking all the courses in civil engineering, but I they allow you to emphasize it. So I emphasized it in structures. And I, as time had progressed, my interest, uh, I realized were really an engineering mechanic. So I, I tried to pursue a uh, double major in engineering mechanics and civil engineering. I came up two classes short, two cybernetics classes. I just couldn't could swing in there. And so here I am uh, interviewing for a job. I had an interview with United States Steel dressed up in my one and only suit. Same one I wore to Gus Dovey's wedding. <laughs> and uh, United States Steel American Bridge Division and they canceled the interview. And there I am wandering around in a suit, nothing to do looking around. And I ran into this guy, Bruce Barkstrom from the joint Institute for the Advancement of Flight Sciences. And it was a, a graduate program set up between George Washington University and NASA headquarters. And it was in situ at Langley, 
research center. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd already, I had already sworn off graduate school. Uh, but I got to looking at that and I thought, man, this looks really interesting. And, and look at these, these people, these, uh, these are people that are doing some really fascinating stuff about structures. And it's more along the line of engineer mechanics that I was interested in. So I decided well, I'd apply for it and I got accepted into that program. And what a lot of people don't understand is, you know, you think if you work for NASA, you must have been uh, majored in aerospace. And what was amazing was the people in the structures area, most a lot of the really great structure, structural engineers, uh, engineering mechanics, structural mechanics, people had civil engineering degrees. Yeah, Thurston, Galen Thurston, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, well, that's true. So anyhow, I ended up uh, at Langley, I think it was in July of 1977. And then uh, our colleague Norm Knight showed up that following August or September, I believe. And uh, he and I were the only two graduate students in structures in that program. I'm sure they had some aero guys and things like that, but we never really crossed paths much. And uh, from there, um, I was well at that time I was working on using micropolar continuum mechanics to develop equivalent continuum models for large area space structures you know that had ultimately hundreds of thousands of members in them that at that well as you remember at that time uh, they didn't have virtual memory and computers and so we had to come up with methods of solving large numbers of simultaneous equations by, and reduce uh, the degree of freedom yeah well, of the problem writing stuff out the tapes and reading it back in when you need it. I think they called them hypermetric storage schemes and, and stuff like that. And we had to take classes in machine language on all that sorts of stuff too. Crazy. There was a fellow named Rich Bryce who taught, you know, that's, that's right. That's right. We, I remember taking a course by Rich Bryce. I'm trying to remember what the name of it was. I thought maybe I could see it on my shelf up there, but something like uh, computer programming and engineering mechanics or something like that. So you know, we had we were sitting right on the cutting edge of of uh, doing computational methods on high powered computers because Langley had some high powered stuff around at that time. That that's right. And when I got hired in the seventies, that was about when people just started using finite element methods for numerical analysis. Yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't too long before uh, that that was basically invented, discovered before. I started working at NASA. Yeah, so I had I had taken a computer programming language, and to this day I haven't figured out why in the world they would want us to learn PL one because it was basically useless. But I had learned Fortran. And you probably remember that big thick green document that NASA CR how to teach yourself Fortran. And I spent the summer teaching myself Fortran, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm fairly decent at it. You know. So anyway, during that study of the space structures, that was when I first mar met Martin Mikulas and Harold Bush. Yeah. Uh, who made a lasting impression on me. Martin went on to be a, a member of the National Academy of Engineering. And uh, of course, Harold contributed many, many uh, projects and could build anything. You, you probably remember some of the space structures joints that he designed and fabricated that were just uh, absolutely that, amazing. That's right. And a lot of the work that you did way back there with Marty Mikulas was about the time we were trying to see what was the best design for the International Space Station. And so building these large space structures had to be analyzed using thousands of nodes to, to understand the behavior of those structures. Yeah, yeah. In fact, um Although I didn't really have an appreciation for this because I'd never been to Coney Island. They were talking about building structures in space the size of Coney Island. That. <laughs> well, that's near and dear to my heart, Coney Island, Mike. <laughs> I, I couldn't really appreciate that, but you know, I knew having, having grown up in, in New York, yeah, we could I could relate to Coney Island. So anyhow, Harold said, Well, you're young, you're not married, you should go ahead and get a PhD, you know, and why you can. And of course, I've never forgiven him for that. You know, that no, was I think I think that was great. And that's how you ended up going to Virginia Tech. That's right. I went into the NASA Virginia Tech Composite Materials Research 
I can't remember what all stands for anymore. Research and education program, I think is what it was. And uh, so basically there were two places in the country where you could study composite structures and composite materials. And that was Virginia Tech and the University of Delaware. Yep. Yep. Uh, Norm, Byron Pipes at University of Delaware. And Norm Knight had been my roommate up until when he got married. Uh, and he was, a, of course, a, he did a bachelor's and master's at Virginia Tech. And he was constantly telling me about how much he enjoyed it, how much he liked it. So I, I seriously considered it. I applied to other places also, but I, I thought that that was the best choice for me. You know, because one, I'd been to Langley, I knew all the guys there, you know, a lot of the guys there. I'd already met Jim, Martin, you know, many others. And, and Virginia Tech had an excellent engineering science department. Yes, that's that's right. And uh, it was perfect for me. And along the way, you know, I, I got to take classes from people like uh, Leonard Myrovich, who, who uh, was famous for many textbooks he, he wrote on dynamics. So I took oh, yeah. vibrations and computational methods and structural dynamics from him, mm -hmm. several vibration courses, actually. And um, Jay and Reddy came, I think, uh, after I'd been there a year, year or two. I took functional mm -hmm. applied functional analysis from him, which is a extremely useful course, as it turns out. Especially yeah. for developing finite elements, right? And he was one of the yeah. one of the leaders in finite element development. He's written a slew of books, maybe, I don't know, 10 or so on uh, yeah. everything from plates and shells to... Him and Zinkevich. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. And uh, let's see, who else did I meet there? Mel Anderson was another one of the greats that I met. Very quiet, reserved, had a mind like a computer. But, but just for the audience, Mike, a lot of these people that you are naming, from the early NASA days, uh, back even before when, when I was there in the 70s, these people were world famous, renowned mathematicians, theoreticians, experimentalists, and, and they had like international recognition in the field, these people. That's right. And, and of course, some of them had some, some fairly large eccentricities that went along with that. I don't know if you ever heard the stories about the great aerolastician Theodore Theodorson, who used to take naps in the tool crib every day. <laughs> <laughs> but there were people like that. Um, and of course, no. I got the work. You know, you had to do an internship as part of the uh, NASA Virginia Tech Composites Program, as we called it for short. And uh, I did it in the structural mechanics branch in 1981 which is where I uh, made my first connection with Manny Stein, Dr. Manny Stein, who went on to mentor me for uh, the next eight or nine years up until his death, actually, when he, after he retired and then he died. And uh, he was there a long time. And uh, he's one, you know, his level of fame for what he did as a member of NACA, uh, you'll find it in some of the great textbooks like uh, Theory of Elastic Stability written by Stephen Timoshenko, who uh, basically, to many, was considered the father of engineering mechanics in the United States. Um, that's he. And, uh, and Manny, uh, well, he helped me figure out my uh, dissertation topic and things like that, because at that time, I was originally assigned to one professor in the EM department who went on sabbatical and he handed me off to another one who went on sabbatical. And finally they handed me off to Eric Johnson in the, uh, he was, he was in the engineering mechanics department at that time, engineering science and mechanics. He wasn't in aerospace at that time. Now um, t tell me something, Mike, was your a, a master's degree and or your PhD degree, was it based on experimental or was it primarily analytical and, and mathematical and numerical? Master's degree was theoretical and computational, and okay. uh, PhD was was primarily you know theoretical and computational. Also, it was uh, when I got hooked up with uh, Jim Starnes and the structural mechanics branch after he hired me in '83. That's when I uh, started getting introduced to more of the experimental things, and and went on to spend quite a lot of time in the lab doing experiments as well as analysis. 
Well, you, you touch on you touch on a couple of things, Mike. And one of the big things that NASA was famous for, at least at the research centers, was mentorship. And you mentioned a couple of great names like Manny Stein in structural mechanics, and then Jim Stons, who was also one of my branch heads. And they invested a tremendous amount of time in mentorship. And I know, as you know, that Jim Stons always showed those three ellipses that he would draw on the, on a blackboard, experiment, analysis, and design. And he would have the double-ended arrow from experiment and analysis and explain in excruciating detail the importance of experimentation. And tell me, was that how you became familiarized with the importance of experiment, experimentation and cor co corroborating your analysis, correlating your analysis with experiment and talk a little bit about that, what you learned from that, uh, from those lessons. Yeah, that's exactly right. In, in fact, we developed what was basically a, a, a feedback loop. You do analysis, you go in, you design some experiments, you conduct them, well, if things don't always go as planned, you look at it, you reanalyze it, you improve the test because, you know, the tests aren't, the tests are only going to be as good as you understand the physics and the analysis is only going to be as good if you're analyzing the test as how you understand the test. And that was the central underlying theme of our uh, branch was the goal being to reduce the dependency on empiricism, improved analytical methods whether they're uh, general purpose methods like we use called STAGs, you know, structural analysis, general shells, mm -hmm. finite element program, the premier nonlinear finite element program for many years before industry caught up. And then uh, special purpose tools used for developing understanding of how certain types of structures may behave, how to narrow down your design space so that then you can hit it with a general purpose tool. You know, it's very expensive to use a to use a sledgehammer on driving and then finish nails. And uh, and unless you understood, unless you understood the real physics of the problem, you may not have a clue that your analysis was missing something that was important. And so this was this constant analysis, experiment, analysis, experiment, and that correlation and learning more what you didn't know. And I, I know that Jim must have told you many times, you know, researchers have this thirst for knowledge. And, wow. and you obviously had it, and it drove you to become excellent in your field and constantly advance the state of the art and our understanding of the physics of the problem and our knowledge. And, and that's what you love to do. Yeah, understanding the, the physics uh, fascinated me, but you know I wasn't alone. There was lots of people like that. The uh, there was definitely a uh, let's say employee development was highly valued in that organization. And if you went out and ran a test or something, and it turned out to be a total flop, well, that was part of the learning process. You know that made you better. That's right. You're absolutely right. And, you know, if you read Harvard, uh, Harvard uh, has a has a professor that Amy Edmondson, she talks about the spectrum of failure from um, uh, from uh, from what is it from? I, I forget what she says, but it's a spectrum of failure from blameworthy to praiseworthy is how she puts it. And, you know, um, what we were doing and, and what you were doing in a laboratory was praiseworthy because you were extending the knowledge. And so you would design the experiments to learn. And, and Jim taught us how to do that using this building block approach. But you were never, the environment you had allowed you to fail, right? It was okay to fail. That's correct. And, and plus, that enabled you not to fall for the illusion of analysis that analysis is perfect it is not perfect by any stretch of imagination if you didn't go in the laboratory the laboratory kept you humble yes and it kept you in touch with the real world the laboratory yep. you know watching experiments in the laboratory opened your eyes a lot of times because there were a lot of unexpected things that, that also happened during tests that you would have never thought of possibly if you took a pure 
analysis approach. You know, so you can use, so it's part of that feedback loop. You can use, you know, some maybe low fidelity testing methods to try to work your way into understanding a difficult subject. Go off, do some analysis, come back, refine your experiment and continue until you, through a building block gradual process, you now have a high level of understanding and a high level of confidence in your answer. And not everyone's cut out to be a researcher. And so I know without mentioning any names, I know you must have encountered some people that just didn't cut it, even at a research center, to be the high level, uh, to reach that high level like you and other members of your team there in structural mechanics were able to reach. Well, that's true. I mean, it happened. Ultimately, a lot of them left and went over to maybe things a little more routine, like engine, the engineering division, or they went into program management or yeah. something like, you know, something like that. Um, like you said, mentorship was highly valued in that organization. And as a result, many of the senior people played an important role in the mentoring because they wanted to make sure they saw the new hires like myself at that time as the legacy of the organization. They wanted to push the corporate knowledge down because as we've discussed before there, we learned all of us, you included, I mean, we all learned lots of stuff that you'll never find in a textbook. Yeah. Yeah. We had all those subject matter experts and, and we, and we could touch on that because if you didn't know something, you had this amazing team around you that could lead you into maybe something that you overlooked in your analysis, some assumption that you may have overlooked and they would give you tremendous guidance. That's correct. And the other thing that they did, which I looking back after all these years was, was sheer brilliance is that they drilled grilled fried you pick the adjective if you want us on presenting technical information both written and oral and it could be brutal brutal honesty when that when you submitted your first draft and it would come back covered in red ink when you finally what got was, one you, you thought was going to pass you know absolutely and and nasa technical publications back in the day were highly, highly regarded. And Mike, I want you to tell me your experience because I came out of school and I thought I was a fairly decent writer. Your first editorial committee at NASA Langley Research Center. How, what was that experience like? I thought I'd just been to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> it was brutal. You know, they just... The, the guys were very direct, you know, in terms of you, how you structure a sentence. What, what is it you're trying to convey? Are you literally me using the meaning of the words and things like that? Because in the academic environment, I found almost all the time you'd read something and you'd have to infer the meaning, you know, and hopefully there was enough context to do that. But they didn't, they weren't big on using literal meanings of words. And man, they really grilled that into me. And then, of course, the, the technical presentations, you remember, we'd spread all our, we, he'd say, go make your charts. What, how are you going to tell the story? You spread them out on the conference room table and, and you go, oh, get rid of this one, get rid of that one. You need to fix this. What the hell does that mean? You know, the whole thing. Like, again, brutally honest. And, and, and here is a, a research that this is your baby. This is your baby that you're presenting, and it's your work, and you brutal, you brutally criticized and critiqued, and it, it it drove me sometimes. To, actually, I would become mad sometimes at, at at how they would go in about this, but it was all it was all for the right reasons, right? The literal meaning of the word that the what you were saying and the results, even if you call the section results. They had to be valid, no kidding results. Otherwise, it was called something like a discussion. And um, the people on the committee, it was usually three or four or five maybe people, several from your area and some from outside your area. That's right. Because you had to be able to convey your message to people from other disciplines. They wanted a broad audience. Yeah. That, that's absolutely right. So then if you were able to get your uh, your publication through that committee, then to show you how seriously NASA took 
the quality of their publications. Then it went to the professional editors. This is a group of people, That's group right. of people that were, that was their sole job was technical writing in English. They were English majors and yeah, yeah, yeah. industry. Some had come from academia and they would just go through it again. You felt like you don't whipped again. You know, let me, uh, let me tell you something, you know, a, a, a little story when, when I was, Thinking about becoming a, a, a NASA astronaut, George Abbey visited and someone said, you got to go talk to George Abbey because if you're ever going to be selected to be an astronaut, you need to go. And I remember him telling me, looking at me and saying, director, right? he was the center director at Johnson Space Center. And he said, you know, he looked at me, Charlie Kamadi, you know, what you need to do is lead that library. He considered Langley a library. Stop playing in the sandbox and come to JSC and and do real work because we're building hardware. Because they didn't, no one had the appreciation of what researchers really did. And so you hone this ability to be a researcher. And now you run these amazing programs and they call you in which is what they typically do when there's a problem and they can't solve the problem, then they go to the research centers. So you were pulled in on some amazing programs. One of them was the Challenger accident and the redesign of the solid rocket booster joint. And another one was trying to understand why foam was coming off the external tank and what caused the Columbia accident. So relate a little bit about how you were able to dive into these problems, you and your team at Langley were able to dive into these problems and see things that other really good engineers did not see. Let's take the SRB joint, for instance, right? Right, yeah, I had been working there three years when that accident happened and, um... Well, let's just say there was a lot of lot of uh, interesting things happened in a very short time. I was assigned to Mel Anderson to help develop shell analyses of the of the joint as a uh, first approximation, trying to understand the sensitivity to clearances and tolerances in that joint. Okay, but before that happened, I remember a large, well, a a, a team was formed at in the structural mechanics branch and in the engineering division. You may maybe you remember Don Hedgepath, one of the the engineers, very colorful dresser, I might add. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a, typical but a, engineer. But a typical straight shooter. But so we're all called together into the headquarters building. And uh there was another engineer who had just come back from Marshall who gave us a briefing on how they thought that joint behaved. And um he went through this litany of arguments that they had presented down there and uh, basically came up the, the conclusion that under pr internal pressurization caused by the uh, propellant burning, about a thousand PSI internal pressure, that that little uh, arm of the U-shape, we called it the clevis, and there yep. was a tang that went into the clevis and then they're pinned together around the circumference of the SRB joint, that that little arm on the interior closed up the gap against the o-ring when the pressure came on and i can i will never forget this as long as i live harold bush is sitting in there you know <laughs> he's like uh, practical to the third power and he's sitting there listening to all this you can see the look on his face like he's turning red as an apple he's sitting there and, and of course here's the center director deputy center director all the division chiefs all this up and the guy says, are there any questions? And Harold goes, I think that's the biggest bunch of bull I've ever heard, except he didn't believe it, it's just bull. <laughs> and see, that was typical, that was typical NASA Langley and the research centers. We were allowed to have those frank, candid discussions and hash it out and put the data on the table to prove things. And so what happened after he said that? Well, see, now he had he had a foundational understanding of how shells work. And he said, it's wrong, and I'll tell you why it's wrong. And he said, basically, the response of that joint is driven by the mismatch and the hoop stiffness, the circumferential stiffness around that shell joint. Because the clevis, being great big and fat compared to the tang that went in there, had a much higher hoop stiffness. And, and so the tang would move out radially more than the clevis would move, and the gap would open. And of course, there were others in there that just 
would not couldn't accept that it was that simple. And that led to what was known as the infamous referee test they did at Marshall. Where yeah. They made it two booster segments at a field joint, sealed up the ends and filled up, pressurized it with water, put LVDTs, you know, the yeah. electric, electrical LVDTs measured uh, or, or instrumentation that measures displacement. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, loaded it up. And guess what? It opened. And Harold's response was, I told you. <laughs> but anyhow, it was that kind yeah. of. Uh, and that what, kind of basic insight into problems that that came from under you know ha having to have a a real understanding of how these problems came about. The mistake that many of the people prior to that had made was they were analyzing that joint as if it were be uh, beam sections, not shells, and, and, and analyzing as if it was perfect that the boundary conditions were perfect. And we know that that doesn't happen in real life. And what a lot of people don't know and don't realize is that that joint had to be totally redesigned. It wasn't the temperature. It wasn't the material properties of the O-ring like what everybody made the sensational story. No, it was a poorly designed field joint, which allowed that gap to open at all right, which allowed that gap to open it all. And it was only until the people at Langley and did the, the nonlinear analysis, structural analysis, and to totally redesigned when Thiokol redesigned that joint that they actually fixed the problem. But it was understanding that root cause, right? And if you look, and if you look at the new joint, what's the first thing that jumps out at you? They, they matched up the hoop stiffness. Exactly. E exactly. In each part, they matched up the hoop stiffness. Yep. Exactly. And I have actually, I have the, the book right here from Alan McDonald, uh, the, the engineer, chief engineer at Morton Thiokol, a really solid guy that just passed away recently. And that's all in that book, uh, as a matter of fact. But now let's uh, fast forward now to the Columbia accident. Right. And so the cause of the Columbia accident was this foam coming off the tank. And so uh, it, the large piece of foam hit the wing leading edge. And lo and behold, the people on the ground didn't analyze it correctly and incorrectly said it was not going to be a problem. It would not cause damage. And it did. But NASA was never able to solve the problem of why that foam was coming off the tank. Right. And so we never had we never understood the root cause and we never fixed it. And we kept flying with foam coming off and damaging the orbit of vehicle. And so let's fast forward to now. After the Columbia accident, you were brought in and had a role in four different teams just trying to understand and trying to predict what caused that what caused that foam to come off. And the really good engineers at Marshall Space Flight Center and Johnson Space Flight Center really were not able to accurately model that and and uh, explain why, Mike. Uh, well, it actually started up to uh, maybe even a year before that. Some of the, the uh, photos that they were taking during ascent were showing uh, foam coming off the uh, inner tank region of the... Uh, external tank, you know, yep. the big beefy inner tank region, mm -hmm. large sheets. And uh, as you may recall, uh, some of the the problems that they were facing at that time was that the EPA had, had just passed an edict and they had to change the blowing agent in the foam. And that changed the mechanical properties. Um, and of course, they were probably phasing all that stuff in, but nonetheless, they knew that there was a problem with this foam, but nobody at that time that I can remember had any appreciation that that could become an impact issue. Yeah. You know? um, nobody, nobody, I, I call that a failure of imagination. Nobody asked the question, what if that, because we at times were seeing large pieces of foam come off and no one said, what if that foam hits the orbiter? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, you know, being called in to work on these things, uh, as you know, first few times you're coming in cold on all this you this first time you've seen some of these things so now you've got to really acclimate yourself fast to these problems 
you know, do a lot of homework and try to come up speed and understand it. And you listen to the discussion and the thing is, uh, well, we've flown this this many times before with non-issues, low probability it'll ever lead to anything. You know, I'm trying to remember what they called that. History of flight, history of flight validation or something like that. Uh, is that what they called it? I can't remember. I can't remember. But, but, but anyhow, if you've been successful in a certain number of times, uh, the thinking there is that um, a lot of these things are going to be non-issues until you get bitten by one of them. You know what I mean? So uh, it's like with the SRB boosters prior to the Challenger accident. There were many boosters that had been taken apart and examined that had burns around the circumference of the O-rings. So they knew yes. something yes. going on there. They no, absolutely. So you're, the, the hardware is telling you something. You see these anomalies, but nobody, they try to lull themselves into believing they understand what's happening and, and they understand the physics of the problem when they really don't. And they come up with a flight rationale to continue to keep flying. Yes. And, and the sad part of it is those O-rings were never certified Um from much beyond room temperature, you know? <laughs> yeah. And they were not supposed to be seeing blow-by at all, right? Cool. Past the first O-ring. And, and, and so they call that normalization of deviance. You see it happen and nothing bad happens. And you keep thinking you understand that all of a sudden you're starting to see the second O-ring starting to have some impingement by the hot gases. And it goes on and on. That's right. And all it takes is what, what they say, 15 seconds of gas flow and you got a liquid joint. You know, yeah. Basically, you turn them to liquid metal. But yeah. Well, anyhow, then going into uh, the accident investigation, originally, you may recall, we all, uh, the evidence, the sensor evidence and things were pointing somewhat that they thought maybe was a, a, a failure in the wheel well that made the tire explode. One of the land gear tires explode. Yeah, yeah. And um, we went down that path for a while. And then finally, uh, I guess they started to examine the launch data and they could see that impact of the of the foam on the wing. And and it and oh. it looked it looked to be pretty significant. And then somebody finally figured out figured out that the relative velocity uh, between the foam and the wing was like 500 miles an hour. It was like 550 miles an hour relative impact velocity. And we knew that a couple of days after launch because the people at Marshall Space Flight Center, the, the, the visual analysis guys, started making those calculations. They, they, they had a uh, enhanced imagery and they started making those calculations. And then people started to use the wrong computer program, which was really just a curve fit of 50 very small impact tests of foam on tile, and they curve fitted to make this, to extrapolate from 400 times larger size piece to predict that it wasn't going to cause a problem. And I got to tell you, Mike, when I saw, I, I was in Russia when this happened, and when I s came back and learned that there were actual people that believed that they could rely on that data to predict this huge piece of foam, 1,400 cubic inches, 400 times over 400 times larger than the smallest piece of foam they ever tested, that that simplistic analysis could predict whether or not the lives of those astronauts in orbit were in danger. That was a travesty to me. That was a sophomore in college would know you could not do that. Yeah, if they'd had any anybody with a with a background in a, in a physics looking at that, I mean, a, a real research type physics, they immediately said, "What in the world are you guys thinking?" Because it was completely used outside of any kind of range of validity. Yeah, and so he, he, it, this comes to like, well, was that data not shared with these managers or with these managers? totally uh, um, technically inept that they would not be able to catch that. You know, it, it really, and, and that's the problem. That's some of the problems we're going to talk about, right? With the agency of, right now. Some of the culture 
I believe was to keep that stuff close to your vest because you didn't want to look stupid in front of your peers. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, it was this get along kind of attitude where everybody had to be driven to consensus. You were a team player. And if you ask tough questions like we typically do in a research environment, you're looked at as a non-team player. And um, but this was uh, this was to me, it was such a travesty. It was uh, almost criminal. But one of the things, Mike, when you were trying to study this now after the accident, how do we predict when this foam comes off? You were able to recognize that we were totally inadequate in our analytical and numerical techniques for predicting it could come off. And this was because of 20, 30 years of history that you have doing research in a particular area. And some of it was that continuum mechanics. So it takes a researcher a tremendous amount of time to be mentored, to learn their craft in a particular area. Now they put Mike Nemeth on the committee to, to oversee this, this team that's trying to predict how the foam comes off and lead us down down that experience that you had. Well, again, you know, here you are, you're thrown into to something that's somewhat alien to you, cold, and so now you got to come up to speed on that. But eventually what, the thing that sticks out in my mind the most is numerous, numerous big group meetings where someone is presenting results and we're all talking about that. And you've got a panel of managers that are sitting up here, you know, that are, are kind of like uh, military brass reigning over all the the underlings and so it's hard to uh, say anything provocative to a certain extent about that and I'm sitting there looking at okay so somebody will present test data and they'll say well we believe that this is a category three test data and it should be believed you know and it's high fidelity and all this and then you get guys they get up there and they're putting up final element results of foam and there's absolutely no way for a manager to quantify the significance of the results, which to a large extent is garbage. And, and the only way they would know that is because someone like Mike Nemeth is in the audience that was grew up in a research background and has a tremendous amount of experience that could basically raise your hand at that meeting and tell them. Yes. And, you know, here they are trying to treat a cellular non-homogeneous uh, structure that has a, a big random element in it as it's sprayed, you know, how it forms. They're trying to treat it as a homogeneous continuum. And it's not, hmm. you know, you, the, who knows what that, if you're, if you're trying to uh, quantify a failure prediction based on stress, what exactly is it? What exactly is that stress you've got? Is it anywhere near reality? And my answer is, I don't think it is, you know, and I got a lot of pushback on that. And so I had uh, one of our guys take a cryoflex specimen, you know, they use for trying to show when foam pops off a substrate and they put it in bending. And I had him put the uh, speckle interferometry stuff on it. We've chilled it down, put the cameras on it, and showed the uh, strain localization in the material, and I presented that to him. And, and I think that got a lot of people's attention. But what grew yeah. out of that, you know, what grew out of that was we showed that there was a need for a manager who's, who's removed from the details of, of how a lot of things work to have some measure of how much faith you can put in analysis. And Norm Knight, myself, and Mark Hilberger wrote a document that laid out how you do this. And we tried to get it into the system, and it was just. You want to know something that's totally crazy, and it brings up another story. When I was director of engineering, and some of my folks would present something to the program manager at that time was Wayne Hale. I mean, I mean. And it I mean. He remember that? And he, it was a structures guy. And Wayne Hale was screaming at this person. I had to make them get off the stage and not present anymore because I wasn't going to let him be abused like that. And I said, you know, uh, he, he didn't understand what this person was trying to tell him. And so Wayne Hale's response was, well, Charlie, 
I want you to have your structures guys come in and give me, um, you know, because I have a degree in electrical engineering, you know, I, I have, I, I, I used to be an engineer and give me a one hour lesson on structural mechanics as if a one hour lecture was going to explain 30 years of experience of a Mike Nemeth and micropolar continuum theory to understand why you cannot predict how the foam is going to fail. That's how simplistic, uh, you know, people have no understanding of what research is. And what you just described, when you look at the cross section of that aluminum with a piece of foam on it and flexing it, what you're talking about doing is looking at the inside of that foam using photoelasticity and looking at points within that foam and stress concentrations in that foam because they have irregularities and voids in that foam. And that's what causes failure. So predicting the overall bending nature of that, you might be able to smear those properties out and do that. But if you want to know how it fails, and this is what was beat into us, right, with Mike, with um, Jim Starnes. You test things to failure, yep, right? That's right. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and know, that's what you did to prove to these people that it's impossible to do this. And the uh, cellular, you know, the cellular structure of foam compared to the grain structure of a metal is it's huge compared to the grain structure. You know? <laughs> so, I mean... You, you have to understand the range of validity of your analysis tools. And, and if, um, you're, if you're preoccupied with, with making lots of management decisions over a very broad spectrum, you have to have something in place by which you can judge effectively the pedigree of an analysis. That's right. That that's right. Into, that translates into cost. And, and, uh, and when we look at when we look back now and look at that crater analysis, that was so simplistic. That was like uh, probably high school physics doing a curve fit of, of 50 data points and somehow thinking that you could predict how something's going to fail and what it's going to look like. It was totally unheard of. And and during these these episodes, we're going to bring in the people that did actually actually be able to develop the analytical techniques to accurately predict how the wing leading edge fails when it's hit with impacted with foam. And one of the things we show is that with the, with the right people and a very small team, you can get to the root cause and develop analyses that are pretty pretty darn accurate. And I truly believe, Mike, that if we had teams of researchers with your pedigree from Langley working with some of these folks in the program office, we would have been able to come up with a solution that would have accurately helped us predict when that foam could potentially come off. But Better, it's- Or we'd have been able to bound it. Yes. Yes, because there are so many irregularities, as we know, from all the different ways that you apply that foam, that, yes. And, yes. and, not, you know, and I think there, there's a lot of uh, temptation among analysts, particularly maybe the ones that mm, don't have an appreciation for the physics of what they're analyzing to, uh, to tune their analysis models until it matches up with results. You know what I'm saying? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. You want to be able to predict how it's going to fail before it fails, not after. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> the super lightweight tank was a, was a good example of that. There had been a test done, a full-scale test done on uh, one of the standard weight tanks that uh, buckled in the uh, Ford Ojas. I don't know if you remember that or not, but anyhow... Um, we were asked to take the model we had developed for a super lightweight tank, put into thickness maps and all that stuff for the standard weight tank, which was thousands of lines of code, I might add. Thousands that had to be checked over and over and over ad nauseum. And I did that uh, almost to the point of insanity. And then we did a nonlinear analysis and they kept us isolated from any knowledge at all about this, how this test progressed and what the results were and so on. And so I uh, 
went, went to Marshall and presented finally the results of our nonlinear analyses of that tank, showed the buckle, showed the, the load range that we thought it buckled in because we had to do imperfection sensitivity analysis to within, you know, four or five thicknesses and we nailed it. <laughs> so that, that was what made the big impression on guys like Mike Pesson, chief engineer of the, of the uh, shuttle program and Bob uh, Ryan. You know. Absolutely. And what you just described was so, so interesting to hear that they held the true results from you and, and, and you nailed it. And what we're going to present in one of the other episodes is showing how this team that de determined how the foam would impact the wing leading edge and cause a failure, how they nailed it before they ran the test. And, and what's amazing was people told us we didn't need to do any analysis before the test, and we didn't need to do hardly any instrumentation, and they were going to run this big test. But, um, but Mike, this is so, this is so um, important. And, you know, then people, so people at Marshall Space Flight Center recognized the importance of you guys and, and your research. And for those that don't, don't know that are listening in, the super lightweight tank was a major change in that huge external tank that houses the, um, the liquid hydrogen and the liquid oxygen was a major change, a major material change because aluminum lithium, the material used for the super lightweight tank was behave like an orthotropic and not an isotropic aluminum structure. Yeah, and the thing, one of the things it had going for it, it was supposed to get tougher at cryogenic temperatures too, as you remember. That's, that's right. There's a little bit of, uh, a little bit of robustness at cryogenic temperatures for the, for the hydrogen tank. And um, yep. But yep. One of the other things that just popped into my mind, you know, along those same, the same vein here, was that um, I was asked to go down and help look at how they were developing their instrumentation for the, I think it was the, either the lab module or the hab module of the space station. They had the big cone on the end of it. And so they wanted to do, uh, they wanted to do some analyses to predict where to put the instrumentation. Okay, so being, you know, good engineers, and, and I'm not, I'm not, saying anything bad here because uh buckling the shells is a tough subject and there's not a whole lot of people around that really understand it so anyhow the guy says well we want to put our instrumentation in these locations you know what do you think and i said well how'd you come up with that he says well we did some buckling analyses with our favorite final element code i think this these were uh, boeing engineers and um i said okay well, let me have a look at it and I said, well, you're probably not going to want to put your instrumentation there. And they said, well, why? I said, because when you do a linear bifurcation analysis like you've just done, you're, you're, uh, that buffing mode that you're using to pick where you want to put your instrumentation, it's a transient because it's an unstable bifurcation. It's not going to be where the, the structure ends up. It's going to be one of many configurations it's going to pass through. That just happens to be the low, one of the low energy ones. So when you have an unstable bifurcation, it's gonna, your shell is gonna move rapidly through all these configurations and then come to rest in the first stable post-buffling mode. So I said, really, you're gonna have to do a nonlinear analysis if you're gonna try to match what you see in the laboratory because you're not gonna see the, the transient <laughs> unless you've got a high-speed camera. So you're gonna match it with the first stable post-buckling mode. And that was a real eye-opener for those guys because that had been completely off their radar. You know, exactly. The manual buckling analysis, cal calculate the eigenvalue. And that was before we had photogrammetric uh, analysis where you could have got a full field um, representation in real time of what the displacements and, and strains were in that tank as it was buckling, as it was. Wow. Yeah. And, and things about like how to analyze shells, I helped them with that. The, the whole concepts of bending boundary layers um, didn't seem to be on the radar either of, of how you get rapid oscillations in the stress and strain fields near the ends of the shell. But it, 
You, you know, we, we're, we're running out of time, Mike, and, and, and there's so much. I could talk to you for days, and we're going to have another episode. Uh, we're going to have another episode with you to continue this because of that. But one of the things you're talking about, Mike, is your your communication and your interaction with these really good engineers, in the whether it's at Johnson, whether it's at Marshall, whether it's at Kennedy, whether it's at Boeing, to understand a problem that's very, very difficult. But it takes someone that maybe has spent or several people that have spent many years in researching this particular phenomenon to be able to guide them and to teach them what they need to know. And, and so I believe there's a way. And what the problem is, we don't pull the researchers in when we need them. When we see the anomalies, we pull them in after an accident, after a catastrophe, after something fails. When we really should have this very integrated team of research experts in multiple different disciplines working together with these good engineers, these good manufacturers that are building, building the product and doing the analysis and testing. And Mike, I'm going to I'm going to close. I'm going to stop this uh, this discussion. But before but before I stop, is there something that uh, that you want to do? Do you have um, do you have a website that people can go to? Maybe I, I know you mentioned once before shellbuckling.com where people could get a hold of your papers because Mike, you've written over 100 papers. Some of your individual papers are over 700 pages long. And so this is a, a total community of practice in one person on, on shell theory and shell buckling. Yeah. Uh, many of them are on Dave Bushnell's website, shellbuckling.com. Shellbuckling.com. And you can find it, some of them if you just do a uh, internet search with, with my name and buckling or whatever the topic is you're interested in. Um, many of them will pop up there. The uh, Okay. And, best way and, is to contact uh, the, or, or go to the NASA technical paper, paper server. I'm sure they're right. all right. And so if anyone has access to uh, good data sets, um, access to data where they could just Google your name, search your name, and, and, and they could get a ton of your reports. The other thing I want to say before we close out this session is, is there anything else that you'd like to tell people in your own words about why research is important or um and, and and maybe the relationship of research and, and management and program managers. I always felt that um, research done by an organization like NASA should be stuff that is just too much of a burden or too expensive for industry to do. We ought to be blazing the trail, looking at uh, ways of potentially enhancing the technology base in the United States. And way before industry starts making a, you know, a financial commitment to doing some of these things. And like you say, there's always a big chance of failure. You're not always going to find the right answer first time out. You know, that's what uh, Edison said, I don't know how many times about his, his life experience. But, but the other thing is that if we're going to do that, we don't need to have researchers working in an environment through a program office where you're encouraged to try to do things to compete with industry. In my opinion, you have just turned an organization like NASA into a work program rather than a research agency or a research. And yep. uh, otherwise, what, how can you justify their existence if they're out there trying to compete with industry and stuff? You can that, justify their existence if they're out there blazing the trail, doing things that you can't, trying through the culture of... Uh, continuous improvement, mentoring, and so on, trying to improve the corporate knowledge and maintain the corporate knowledge, because if you're thinking that's going to be maintained in a university, you are sadly mistaken, because their corporate knowledge goes up and down cyclic based on a uh, number of graduate students. Yep. And so on, you know. 
and we're gonna and we're gonna learn. continue this because this is a good segue into part two with Dr. Michael Nemeth at NASA Langley Research Center and the importance of of research. Thank oh, you, I'm Mike, for for spending so much time with us. You're welcome. I'm, I'm, I've re retired since 2013, and now I've completed the circle. I'm back to the shovel. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Take care, buddy. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Leading Edge Discovery Podcast with Charlie Camarda, part of the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then share this channel and itspmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. Thank you.